Hello everyone, my name is 4AS and welcome to my channel. This is a series of video essays where I cover political, economic and revolutionary topics which are relevant to our time. I read the books, so you don't have to. In a world where money rules the land, there is one critique that is left unspoken. Integrity leads to innovation. Innovation leads to inequity. Inequity leads to insanity. Join me as we explore the four eyes of capitalism. Now, I don't need to remind anyone in Australia that we have a federal election coming up. It'll be the usual announcements, campaigning, and jockeying for marginal electoral seats. But there's a line that's cropped up in political discourse that has got me thinking. This line is something along the lines of Liberals and Labour are exactly the same. They're two sides of the same coin. <sighs> Poor nationals. Everyone seems to forget about them. Oh well. I guess they're too busy. After all, those cotton farms on the Murray Darling aren't going to allegedly water themselves. <laughs> but all jokes aside, are Labour and Liberals exactly the same? So instead of pensioners worrying about franking credits they don't even have, or your weekend not being killed by EVs, let's look into the facts, shall we? But first, a disclaimer. A disclaimer for this and future policy videos that I do on my channel. We all know that at the end of the day, politics should be about a contest of ideas. I fully respect people who look at the political party I go over today and say, they're not doing the thing I care about, or they're not going far enough with the policy I care about. I hope there is, I hope to present here a steel man argument of the party and to start a dialogue about what is good for the Australian people. I trust my subscribers are curious people and decide what they think is right or wrong at the end of the day. Having said that, let's jump right in. The Australian Labour Party, or ALP for short, are a party that came out of the trade union and cooperative tradition which policy-wise have added huge structural changes to the Australian landscape. To those of you who don't know, when I say structural changes, I mean specifically a dramatic shift in a way an industry or market functions, usually brought on by major economic developments. So, Gough Whitlam brought in free university education. Bob Hawke brought in Medicare. Paul Keating floated the dollar. Run and Swan implemented the stimulus package in the GFC, which was praised by economists all over the globe. And Julia Gillard started the NDIS program. All of these were really important reforms of their time and had lasting implications for Australia as a nation. But I'm sure you're asking, that's all well and good, but that's what Rudd stood for. What does Albo stand for? Well, depending on who you ask, especially experts, we are living in a time that desperately needs structural reform. First cab off the rank is aged care. To put things into perspective, the Royal Commission into Aged Care Quality and Safety had a final report that came out in February 2021. And even in the chair's preface, you can tell there is something desperately wrong with the sector. There can be no doubt of the public importance of the Australian aged care system for every Australian of every age. Nor can there be any doubt that a Royal Commission with the independence that it entails was needed to inquire into the quality and safety of the system that in the interim report was described generally as besieged by neglect. This was a sector affected bit by bit by the Aged Care Act 1997 
The privatisation of aged care facilities reduced the quality of care. As Tim Cornwall states, rather than adequate minimum quality standards, there were pages and pages in the legislation about how government money would support the now privatised sector. What transpired was that the Howard government poured billions into the industry, largely losing transparency and control over the quality of care offered. But it doesn't stop there, of course. Neoliberalism does what it does best. It privatises and attacks wages. This caused, caused aged care workers to be underpaid and be thrown into more precarious work situations. When beginning their career, the award rate for a full-time aged care worker is $21.09 per hour, slightly less than a cleaner, and only $1.25 per hour more than the Australian minimum wage. It goes without saying that aged care workers do much more than clean. The job is substantially more complex and demanding, both physically and emotionally. Okay, well, what's Labor's response? Labor has proposed that in order to improve the system, that aged care facilities will have to have a registered qualified nurse on site 24-7 that it would implement the findings of the Royal Commission. For example, that there are more carers in facilities, so elderly Australians receive an average of 215 minutes of care per day, better food for aged care residents, and of course, a pay rise for aged care workers. The other huge element to come out of aged care is to establish transparency and accountability in aged care. That's why Labor has committed to stronger penalties to protect elderly Australians. Uh, feel free to stop the video and go over the screenshots I've provided. All these policies have a huge amount of detail and it's worth exploring. The aged care reform is expected to be an extra $2.5 billion. Now, before anyone cuts me off about a wrongly quoted cash rate, let's move on to the next policy, namely childcare. Again, it's a major election issue about the cost of living and how prices for everyday commodities has gone up. But this was already the case and hasn't been an issue that has mysteriously cropped up in 2022. Alan Austin states that in 2021, the latest area of economic failure is the surge in the cost of living. The Australian Bureau of Statistics revealed that over the last year, costs rose overall by 3.85%, the highest since September 20, um, 2008. The price of fruit increased 6%, beef 13.5%, uh, medical services 6.7%, footwear 4.9%, furniture 5.9%, and car fuel 6.5%. It's for this reason that all families are feeling the pinch. So why should young families have to sacrifice incomes? Jason Roberts reported in January, that childcare prices rose by 6.5% in the three months ended December 2021 across the metropolitan cities of Australia, compared to the same period last year as COVID-19 uh, impacts, sorry, uh, year as COVID-19 impacts receded and providers returned to more historically consistent fee increase patterns. Labor's response to this has been a proposal to lift the maximum childcare subsidy rate to 90% for families with their first child in care. That there is an increase in subsidies for single child families, earning less than 530k jointly, and expanding the subsidy to outside school hours care. The investment will be approximately 5.4 billion starting from July 2023. Speaking of rising costs, 
This topic goes hand in hand with what's going on with people's wages and salaries. Labour makes the claim that under the current government cost of living has gone up by 3.5%, whilst, whilst wages have only increased to uh, 2.3%. They say a picture tells a thousand words, and that's certainly the case with graphs from the ABS. Profits have skyrocketed from the period of the GFC to 2021, and sure, a period of wage growth of 59% since 2008 looks impressive in isolation. It doesn't look so impressive when you take into consideration that profits have increased 92%. Personally, I think this puts Labour's cost of living claim in pers into perspective. But that's just me, though. <coughs> Job keeper. <coughs> Sorry about that. <clears throat> Plus, we're not even taking into consideration the general unease of a skills gap emerging in Australia. Closed borders have added to the skills gap that Australia faced before the pandemic. The latest Australian Institute of Company Directors Sentiment Index released on Thursday shows labour shortages are a top economic challenge. Some 60% of directors nominated skill shortages followed by global economic uncertainty and climate change as important issues. Labour's plan is to fund up to 20,000 extra university places over 2022 and 2023, and provide access to 465,000 free TAFE places in nominated areas of skill shortages. Fee-free TAFE places in targeted areas will help rebuild the industries hit hardest by the pandemic, like hospitality and tourism, as well as meeting current and future needs in the care economy, including jobs in childcare, aged care, disability care, and nursing and community services. These announcements are further supplemented by 45,000 new TAFE places, the establishment of Jobs and Skills Australia, Same Jobs, Same Pay legal protection, and a commitment to making wage theft illegal. This policy will be $1.2 billion to implement it. Albo has made no secret that he was raised by a single mum on a disability pension, where they lived in public housing. But the providing of this sort of service has been a staple for the Australian government. Providing moderately priced public or social housing has been a key government responsibility since the reconstruction period following World War I. Some administrations have achieved more than others. Few have failed as badly as the coalition from 2015 onwards. The Bureau of Statistics released data on housing starts in the private and public sectors from 1983 to September 2021. Bob Hawke's government built an average of 12,563 houses for low-income Australians to rent or buy in each of its eight years. This collapsed to an appalling 4,399 per year through the hapless Howard period, when the rich did very nicely while the poor were neglected. The Rudd government almost doubled that to 8,615, and it has been downhill from there. As such, Labour plans to build 20,000 social housing properties, supporting 21.5k 20, full-time jobs per year, or 1 in 10 direct workers on sites with, um, with apprentices, 4,000 homes for domestic and family violence sufferers and older women on low incomes, uh, 10,000 affordable homes for frontline workers to live closer to where they will work will mean um, you know, better services for everyday Australians. This is followed by $200 million for repair maintenance and improvements of housing in remote Indigenous communities, $100 million for crisis domestic violence, transitional accommodation and older women on low incomes, and $30 million to build housing and provide health specialists for homeless veterans. 
Quite honestly, there is a lot of detail in, AL in the ALP's plan. I could go further into manufacturing and the 15 billion National Reconstruction Fund, where Labor make the case for commodities to be Australian made again. The Powering Australia plan, where Labor breaks down the specific investment they plan to do with renewables. That is boosting renewables in the national electricity market to 82% upgrading the electricity grid to improve energy transmission, a $3 billion investment in green metal production, which has the lowest still produced carbon footprint possible. And this sort of investment will hit the emissions reduction target of 43% by 2030, compared to 26 to 28% target of the coalition. Then there's, of course, the plan for jump-starting Medicare again, where there will be a change to the rules uh, to allow regional and outer metro communities to recruit more doctors of their choosing, including overseas GPs, to help address a skill shortage that is worsening in regional Australia, and also the establishment of 50 urgent care clinics. And of course, Labor's plan to build, to build up the NDIS again and to scrap the cashless debit in due card. The latter issue I have actually covered before in my SCOMO and the social question video. So check it out by clicking the link in the description. Uh, that's if you haven't checked it out yet. Well, in the meantime, aren't we all blessed that the Prime Minister has put his empathy training to good use? But of course, if there's anything you're curious about and I hadn't covered today, I'll make sure to leave a link to the ALP website so you can have a look for yourself. Uh, one final thing. Compiling all of this info together was quite time consuming and I wanted to thank Kath for helping me out. So quick shout out to her. You know who you are. If you enjoyed today's episode, please like, share, and subscribe. Also, let me know if you enjoyed this content. I'm happy to do more policies and principles videos on any of the other political parties. And with that, everyone, remember to keep thinking and keep learning. Goodbye till next time.